this better? Oh, there we go. I can hear myself. Well, welcome everybody. We're glad you're here on Mother's Day, on this Lord's Day. Uh, note to my mom, if you're watching, which you're probably not, just want to remind you, I was the one who made you a mom. And of your two children, I am the one who's going to pick a better home for you. So happy Mother's Day. No, just a joke. We got a nice spot in the basement instead. No. No, I love my mom. Well, we're glad you're here. Today we're going to continue on with a little mini-series that we are doing uh, as we lead up to our church's 75th anniversary. And we're not really calling it the remember and celebrate, but that's what we're doing. We are remembering and celebrating the goodness of God that he has shown to us over the last 75 years in our history. So... Uh, We really do hope that uh, those of you who have been a part of this church uh, will be planning to attend that celebration with us in June. Um, But in this series, as we lead up to that event uh, on the 18th of June, we're looking at some of those pivotal events and some of those areas of focus that have defined the ministry of EBC over the last 75 years. Last week, Pastor Van took us through uh, our mission of mercy that, that in our church's history, that this mission of mercy has been something that has defined us, um, that we have made it a part of our DNA uh, to try and reach out to those who are hurting and vulnerable, um, and to those who, who need to see the love of Jesus. And so today, we're going to look at something that is appropriate for Mother's Day, um, and that's an area of Christian education. And this isn't working either. So if you could help me out there, Drew, I'm going to just be looking at you. So, um, and yeah, Christian education, and, and we're not going to be looking at now, why you need to be going to a Christian school or anything like that. But we're going to be looking at this idea that educating our kids in the fear and admission of the Lord is an important part of who we are as a church and who we are as Christians. And so as we do this, though, I want to make a couple disclaimers. One is that I'm going to talk about Christian education in very general terms. It's not about Christian schooling per se. It is really about this idea of us teaching our kids Christian principles. And the second one, and it's probably a little bit more important for some people, is I'm going to step on a few people's toes today. And unlike in other times in the past, it will probably be very unintentional. Like I don't mind stepping on people's toes when it's appropriate. But this time, there's just so much to this topic and so many other things that we're going to get into that... My guess is that some people feel that their toes are stepped on, not because of what I actually say, but maybe because of some of the things that I don't say. And so for that, if that's the case, I just want to ask your forgiveness in advance. Um, But I do hope and pray that as we get into what God's Word has to teach us about this idea of of Christian education, uh, that we hear what God's Word has to say to us. And that we as a body uh, can embrace our role within that. So so before we do this, let's let's start off with a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, uh, we do come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you and you for all that you have done for us. Thanking you that uh, you have given us this time where we can open up your word and see what it says, see how it applies to us, and how we can live out these truths in a way that honors you. And God, on this Mother's Day, we thank you too, especially that, that you have given each of us a mom. And we do recognize that as was acknowledged earlier, that 
not everybody's experience and is the same. Sometimes the, the thought, the memory of their mom is lacking or it hurts. But it is something that we all share even in common with your son. Uh, that we have uh, a mom. And we're thankful for that, that you've given us life in that way. And so, God, as we just take these next few minutes to open up your word, uh, we invite your spirit here to be with us, to teach us, to speak to us. And I do pray that we as a church will see how we all have a, a role and uh, what it means to educate our kids, educate the next generation to know you and to love you. So God, we do pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we all know that we live in a very complex world that requires us to investigate it, to study it, in order for it to make sense to us. And even with that studying and investigation, it still doesn't make sense to some of us. We also know that we live in a fallen and sinful world, and in order for us to discern truth from error, uh, we need to be grounded in the tools and the methods of critical thinking. Yet in order to discern good and evil, we also need to be able to discern and be well-versed in what God's word has to say about this world. You know, there was a time within the history of the church, uh, and on, on a broader scale, that the church itself took the primary role, took the primary responsibility in educating our children. And the purpose of that was to glorify God in all that was, that was taught. Uh, and not only to glorify God, but it was to, su to support the discipleship of those children so that they would grow in knowing and loving Jesus. So teaching kids to read and to write was really to help them know how to understand the Bible and to know God himself. You know, monasteries and churches offered education to teach children practical skills. You know, they taught reading and writing and math. And, um, you know, and there really is a reason why uh, England, specifically, and even parts of the United States are filled with so many uh, church-based schools. Because it, it you know, really only made sense that if you're going to have a church, then you should have a school to go along with it to teach the children. In the same way, you can look at some of the earliest uh, universities within this country and, and around Europe that always had Christian theology as a foundational module for their subjects. I mean, consider Harvard University's original mission statement. This is their original mission statement. Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the end of his life and studies is to know God in Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. Right. To know Christ is the foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. I don't think that's their, their charter today. So Harvard, that was the, our nation's first university. Our second university, the College of William and Mary said that the Church of Virginia may be furnished with a seminary of ministers of the gospel and that the youth may be piously educated in good learning. These are our first two universities in our country who now have turned their back on, on Christ. You know, and it's only a recent phenomena within the history of our country that the state has taken over educating our children. For the last 60 years or so, as we all know, the Bible 
which really is the foundational book for, for all of the Western society, the Bible has been systemically or systematically removed from educational settings. You know, we call it the separation of church and state. And we don't want to offend anybody who doesn't believe in it. But either way, what used to be the starting point of education in our country now is nowhere to be seen. And unfortunately, now our children are, instead of being exposed to the Bible, are being exposed to a continued growing secularization, sexualization, uh, and an unchristian influence of our culture. On the next slide, uh, see a quote by C.S. Lewis. It says that if all the world were Christian, it might not matter if all the world were educated. But our cultural life will exist outside the church, whether it exists inside or not. Good philosophy must exist, if for no other reason, because bad philosophy needs to be answered. Whether or not we accept or embrace or anything outside the church, whether if we want to just hide inside our own little churches themselves, culture outside is still going to exist, and that needs to be confronted with truth. And so within our own church history, here at EBC, that was something that we knew and embraced, and we still know and embrace. Which is why in 1967, uh, EBC started what uh, became and is now Legacy Christian Academy. But at the time, Xenia Christian Day School started with just a kindergarten class. And I believe Mike Mikesell was a part of that very first kindergarten class. Um, so, you know, we got, we got some uh, anchored history here. You know, that, that school that started with a kindergarten grew until where in 1983 the first graduating class happened. Uh, and of course, changes over time and all that, but there is a rich history um, that started here at EBC. Again, we're not going to be talking about that. We're not here to pat ourselves on the back for that, uh, but that's just a part of of who we are is that we recognize that that need to engage with our culture and engage with our kids in such a way that education is a part of that uh, has been part of what has defined who we are as a church. On the next slide, there are just a few, for some people, it might be a few memories. And I'm going to see if you can spot who they are. And go ahead and click through them all for me, Drew. So... I don't know if you recognize where that building is, but that's the old building. And there's three faces that you may recognize up there. So on the upper left there, that's Mrs. Killian. All right there in the top middle, that's Mrs. Hodson, Carolyn Hodson. And then down there in the bottom right, which is a much smaller picture, but that's Mrs. Dunstan there. So I think this is like circa 1987, 1988. So going back some time. But, I mean, so, so why would our church start a school? Why would we think that Christian education is important? And this is really the crux of it. Again, it's not to celebrate the fact that we did something that's great that has carried a legacy over all these years. But there is a reason why this is an important concept of philosophy. And the reason is, is it starts with the mission of the church. In the most simple terms, EBC and every evangelical church has a twofold mission. You can go ahead and click that next slide for me there. Well, first is this, and hopefully this will sound familiar to you. It says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. 
And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The next one highlights two things. Two things. To love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor. And again, these should sound pretty familiar with it. And if they don't sound familiar with it, then maybe we just need to look at the side of our building because that's something that we really want to emphasize here at this church. That we exist to honor God, to know him, to worship him, to do what he says, and to live according to his design. We also exist to love people. Drew, if you could put on that next slide there. Thank you. And to love people, that really is that, that mission of mercy that Van talked about last week. It's to show love and compassion to others, to care for the weak and the vulnerable, to share the love of Jesus, to t- point toward healing and redemption that is found in Jesus Christ. You know, I asked Barb about this uh, on Friday, but EBC first started using this, this slogan, this mission statement Uh, The earliest that she could find was back in August 23, 1998. That EBC exists to honor God and to love people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Every local church demonstrates these two things in their own way. But the mission of any church really should include this great commandment. to honor God, and to love people. But there's a second aspect to the mission of the church, and this too should sound a little familiar to you. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, to the very end of the age. Now there are three things I just want to highlight in this. And if you're taking notes, there's some, some blanks that you could be filling in here. But this is B under the Great Commission. The first thing is, as you're going. The command to go is not just a one-time activity where you choose to get up off your duff and go and do something. Wherever we go as God's people, we are to be making disciples. Ministry isn't meant to be carried out by a few select professional Christians or mission agencies. But God's command was given to every member of his church. That's everybody in this room who claims to be a follower of Jesus. So whatever you are doing, whoever you interact with, wherever you are going, as you are going, you are to make disciples. And certainly in this context of Christian education, Who better to disciple than our own kids? They're a captive audience. It's one of the reasons why my wife and I decided to homeschool our kids. It wasn't necessarily because we didn't want to expose them to the public schools. It wasn't necessarily because we thought that we could give them a better education. But it's because we felt that we had a duty and a calling by God to be the ones to invest in our kid's life. To be the one to disciple our kids in such a way that we are aware of the direction that they're heading. You know, the average kid spends six hours a day in a classroom setting. Not counting all the time that they spend at school with their friends or doing extracurricular activities. You 
You take that versus the less than one hour a day that the average parent spends face-to-face -face with their kids. And so we made the decision that we would rather have those six hours in context with us as their parents rather than in context of, of sending them to a school, whether Christian or public, because we wanted to take that responsibility of discipling them. The mission of the church is as we are going to make disciples, the third thing there is to teach those disciples to obey. Uh, R.B. Cooper is probably a name that most of you don't know, and that's okay. He was the president of Calvin College up in Michigan back in the 1930s. But he stated that a noteworthy feature of the Great Commission is that it bids the apostles and the church of all ages, to teach. In fact, teaching is spoken of as their chief missionary task. They are to go in order to teach. Making disciples requires teaching. And it is clear that Jesus desire, desired disciples to be made in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But he didn't really want just converts. His desire was for educated individuals to know the word of God. And to know that the Old Testament was, was fulfilled through Jesus. And that life comes through him. So the mission of the church is the great commandment. And the Great Commission. To honor God, love people, make disciples. So if that's the mission of the church, then how do we go about doing that? Again, Christian education, in a very broad sense, is one of those ways in which we go about doing that. But it's not just a matter of taking our kids and shipping them off and hoping that somebody else will do that. So part of this is that we understand that the responsibility of discipling our kids, the next generation, the responsibility is that of the parent in partnership with the church. And so those are the blanks on the next slide there, that it is the responsibility of the parents in partnership with the church. See, the education of children is the prerogative, not of the state, but of the parents in conjunction with the church. As parents, we are ultimately responsible for the education of our kids. And this is a task that I would dare say that we should not shy away from, nor should we abdicate to others to do. You know, Greg read this earlier, but Ephesians 6.4 says that parents are to bring up their children in the training and the instruction of the Lord. It's the parents, mom and dad. They're the ones that are called out on this. We are going to be the ones that are held accountable for the training and instruction of our kids. It's not the church per se. It's not Christian schools. And it's certainly not the government school's responsibility. It is the parent. Now, of course, we're not going to be held accountable for whether or not our kids accept our instruction or not. They all have their own will. And God will hold them accountable to how they receive it. But it is our responsibility to our kids to do that. And then, as Greg was saying earlier, with the charges that he gave, that we as a church take on that responsibility in doing that. You know, long before Hillary Clinton wrote the book, you know, It Takes a Village, you know, 
that idea of it taking a village was an African proverb many, many, many years before she wrote that. But that concept is still true. Is that it takes a community of people to help raise up a child. Now, I don't know, those of you who are at least my age or older probably remember a time when you were out in public and another adult would come alongside to an, a child and reprimand them in a way that pointed them in the right direction. How many of you ever had that happen? Or no, That happened to me all the time. I don't know. I was that type of kid. There was always some other adult coming up to me, correcting me. Yeah, rightly so, exactly. Nowadays, we shy away from that. We actually think that's offensive if another adult were to come and correct our kids. But that was always this idea that it took the entire community to help point us in the right direction in our education. Proverbs 22 says, train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they are old, they will not turn from it. Of course, you know, that's not a, a blanket guarantee that no child will ever turn away from the truth. But it is this sense that when we, as parents and as a community, are working together to train up a child, they will know, they will understand the right way to do it. So, of course, that raises the question that, you know, are the children in our church turning away when they get to their teenage years? And if so, why is that? I don't have easy answers for that. Really, that's not really the point of this. But, But as church members and fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, we're all a part of the same body. And we are all responsible to each other. That's what we commit to do as a church. The role of Christian education in the local church is undoubtedly to teach the scriptures. To disciple believers so that they can know God and to make him known. Now the Bible gives a precedent for the local church to educate children. Not just children, men and women as well, but, uh, but we are to educate them in spiritual areas of life. Now, while the Bible doesn't indicate that a Christian school must be established, there are many biblical principles that can provide a reason for the local church to do such a thing. You know, and some of those principles are even in the the charges that Greg gave us earlier. uh, That he gave us as a church as we dedicated those children to the Lord. But I'll say this, there is no right way to educate our kids. To use a term that we've heard Greg say a lot, there is no thus saith the Lord when it comes to how or where we should educate our kids. There's no right way to say that you have to homeschool your kids or that you have to send your kids to a Christian school or that if you send your kids to a public school that you're doing the wrong thing. That is not in Scripture and that's not what I'm trying to say. So please hear me on that. These different conclusions, these different ways that we as individuals and families decide to educate our kids should not lead to division in the church. And unfortunately, in the history of EBC, those types of ideas, those types of decisions have caused division. This was before my time, but there was a time in our church where there was a group of people who said, we needed to be a homeschooling church. And that if you did not choose to homeschool, then you're in sin. And a group of people left. There was a time in, even in the formation of Christian education, that there were individuals of other races that were not as open or openly accepted in our school. 
So just because we have done this doesn't mean that we've been right all the time, that we've gotten it right all the time. That's what we, hopefully as a church, have learned and sought forgiveness and pursued the Lord more fully and accurately. But we've all known people who have raised their kids in different ways. We all know the homeschoolers. We all know the Christian school kid. We all know the ones who send their kids to public schools. And we should be supportive in that. But the fruit of all this the fruit that is produced is more often dependent upon the parent's involvement and the family dynamic rather than where or how children are educated. It is just as much the responsibility of a parent who sends their kid to a public school to be discipling their kids, to be aware of what's going on, to be confronting maybe the, the lies that they might be taught in the public school, as it is for a parent who sends their kid to a Christian school. Because not every Christian school has it 100% accurate, right? I mean, I went to a Christian school when I was young, and I thought it was a fairly decent school. But there were some things, looking back about it, that... I would say that that probably wasn't a biblically-based way of approaching it. Or they certainly had a way of taking subjects and compartmentalizing them in such a way that really the Bible had nothing to do with history or math. But we as parents have that responsibility to show how God's world, how God's creation interacts and intersects in all those ways. So some of the precedent in terms of how we should go about this, like where is the scriptural basis for this? Well, next slide. We'll see some of the, the verses that you can even take. Hear, O Israel, and this is coming out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Where have we heard that before? These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Here God's telling us as parents that we are to impress God's truth on our children. I think of it almost like a Play-Doh mold. When you press into it, and you get the exact representation of what was pressed into it. Or like silly putty when you put it on a comic strip and, it, and you get that comic on the putty itself. It says that we're to talk about God's truth everywhere, not just in church, day and night. When you're watching a movie with your kids, I don't know if that counts for Bible, EBC bingo, does that count? Is that good? Okay. We're to talk about it when we're at home or on the road. It says to tie them on our hands or bind them on our forehead. You know, the binding on our forehead literally means between the eyes. Now, that's not necessarily that it should be a literal thing, um, that we should be writing it on our foreheads or tattooing it on our arms or things like that. But like in Exodus 13, 9, which you can go back and look at, um, or like the idea of hiding God's word in our heart, there's, that's a metaphor for the way that we should be making these issues clear and visible. They should be front and center in our lives, always present in our interactions with our children. 
You know, a similar idea of this is in Psalm 78. It says, we will not hide the teaching of their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law for Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. And here's the reason why. So that the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they, in turn, will tell their, their children. Then they will put their trust in God. They would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commandments. The reason we are to educate our kids, the reason Christian education exists, and again, in that broad sense, not in a school institutional sense, is so that the next generation would know God. That they would put their trust in him. That is why we do this. Well, Drew, if you could move ahead a few slides to the goals of Christian education. You know, we, we've all heard of Socrates or Socrates. Well, Bill and Ted's excellent adventure reference there. But. Socrates argued that teaching and education serve to enlighten the ignorance of people. But his humanistic approach also led him to contend that education is what could remedy society. And with that sort of as the foundation for semi-modern education, for thousands of years and in various societies and cultures, we've had this tendency to seek human-engineered solutions for the problems that affect all of humanity. But as Christians, we know and we believe that salvation and salvation, or salvation and submission to Jesus Christ is the only remedy for society. And that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And of course, that's not to say that when somebody comes to Christ that all of a sudden they know everything although there are a few of us that like to think that we do. And that's certainly not to say that when we come to Christ, that means all of our problems go away. But it is to say that true education starts with God himself and with his word. And that he created this world, both everything we see and all those things that we can't see, And that we, meaning you and I, were created in his image. And that we were meant to represent the creator throughout his creation. And so with that as our starting point, God, who created us in his image to represent him, if that's our starting point, what possible knowledge in this world about its purpose and its design could possibly be irrelevant or uninteresting. If God made it for us to represent him, what subject could be that uninteresting to us? With that as our starting point, even calculus and trigonometry, though mind-boggling difficult, seems worth the time and effort to learn. With that as a starting point, that's why history's leading science, scientists and politicians and scholars were followers of Christ throughout history. Here's just some of the names that you might recognize. Robert Boyle with Boyle's Law regarding gases. Antoine Lavoisier, the father of modern chemistry. I'm sure I botched that French name, but it's okay. 
Michael Faraday, Gregor Mendel, Isaac Newton, George Washington Carver, Blaise Pascal, Lord Kelvin, Nicholas Steno, and many, many more. These were all men, and there were other women as well, who believed that the understanding of this world in which they lived in, that understanding this world was a way to glorify God and to worship him. So what are the goals of Christian education? So again, in the most general terms, I, I, I want to propose that there are four primary goals. The first one is this. It's the formation of sound doctrine. Concerning its goal, education should be the intentional, directed effort towards making disciples of Jesus Christ. And a theologically rich Christian education contributes to the church's ministry of discipleship. The formation of sound doctrine is the teaching of right beliefs. It's the teaching to our children and to each other the correct things about God and the world and about mankind. It's the true and the good and the beautiful. The second goal of a general Christian education is to build godly character. Too often, because we have delegated our responsibility to teach and train our kids to others who may or may not know Jesus, or who may be forced to use a curriculum that is contrary to the Bible, the results are far from producing the type of character that we desire for our kids. As one Bible teacher put it, if we send our kids to be educated by Caesar, we shouldn't be surprised when they come out acting like Romans. Now again, this is in broad general terms, and I'm glad we have teachers who are being salt and light in our public schools. If it wasn't for that, I you know, certainly worry about our country as it is. But I'm grateful for people like Ron and others who are in those schools representing Christ that way. If the first goal is the formation of right beliefs, which is orthodoxy, then the second goal is the formation of right practices, which is orthopraxy. Of course, we all know that just because somebody does the right thing doesn't mean that they actually have godly character. We all know an Eddie Haskell type person. You know, somebody who says and does the right thing in front of one audience, but then shows their true self in front of another audience. Building godly character is the formation of Christ-like disciples who faithfully and obediently engage in good works for the glory of God. And we do this out of love for each other, and love for him. You know, it's, it's in part what Romans 12, 2 is getting at when it says that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The character of the developing child is as important, if not more so, than the academic achievements that they have. So we have formation of sound doctrine, building godly character. The third one is the development of a Christian worldview. Uh, Douglas Wilson, who wrote The Case for a Classical Christian Education, argues that the Christian nature of education, uh, because of any attempt to educate oneself, is sure to raise fundamental issues concerning life and such questions need spiritual answers. You know, developing a Christian worldview is the formation of disciples who view the world through the lens of the Bible. We all look at life differently. 
which is why we all respond to life differently. We all have the lenses that we look through. And our lenses shape how we respond to our feelings and how we respond to moral and social issues and how we understand the purpose that we have for living. But just like in life, where some of us need corrective lenses to see things clearly, when it comes to the things that we know and the things that we believe and things that we need corrective lenses in that regard. You know, we currently live in a culture in a world that says that life is an accident, that it's chaos and disorder, that there is no purpose, there is no meaning, there are no absolutes. And so when generation after generation is exposed to that type of worldview, what kind of results do we expect to see? No wonder people reject biological facts and deny their own God-designed sex and gender. Because if it's not all an accident, if you can determine it yourself, if there was no purpose to begin with, then you can make it whatever you want. No wonder people think that killing an unborn baby is okay, because if life is an accident, or if it's meaningless... Or if you can do whatever you want as long as it doesn't hurt somebody else, then why shouldn't they do it? But even that is held inconsistently because, you know, people would say, well, then why shouldn't Russia invade Ukraine? Don't they have the right to determine their own existence or claim what they feel is theirs? This is the world we live in. But that's not the world that God created. God created this world with purpose and meaning and design and with absolutes in it. And a Christian worldview gives answers to all those questions. And we as parents are responsible to help teach our kids what that is. And the fourth goal of Christian education and again, whether that education is at home or whether it's through a Christian school, or whether it's us intentionally engaging with our kids who are going to public schools. But the fourth goal is to prepare our kids for ministry. And that's not to say that every kid is meant to be a pastor or a full-time overseas missionary. But the goal is the formation of disciples who think missionally. Those who think, who are able to share their faith, who are able to help others grow in their faith, who show mercy and engage in the ministry of the church. You know, we had this perspectives class this last semester on Sunday nights, about 15 or so from EBC and another 25 from other churches were a part of that. But one of the things that was emphasized in that perspectives class is that we are all in full-time ministry. Every single one of us. No matter what our job or vocation is or what our skills are, God calls us to be salt and light wherever we are. As we are going. And so Christian education is a helpful tool to spread the gospel. And a good education is one that effectively enables the faith to be passed on faithfully to future generations. And so our charge as a church, you know, maybe, maybe it's to start another school. Probably not. But our charge as a church is to continue on with that calling to invest in that next generation, to invest in the education of our kids, 
future generations so that we raise up generations who know and love Jesus and who are able to express themselves and communicate in such a way that reflects the nature and character of God as he intended it. And my prayer is that for the next 75 years, that this church will hold on to that calling very tightly and live that out in such a way that there will be many more generations raised up for him. Pray with me. And I'll have the worship team come up. Father, such a high calling that you've given us to invest in future generations. And I pray that we as parents, those who will become parents, will live out that calling. We'll take the responsibility of investing in our kids. Thank you just for the rich history that this church has and, and, and being a part of that for many generations. And we pray that you will be honored and glorified in all things. And we pray this in Christ's name.